Good morning. I can hear you from beyond. It's good to see you guys this morning. Give me some thumbs up to let me know you're watching. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. So the thing is, when you're doing, if those of you don't know, if you're doing live casting on Facebook, what happens is the questions are delayed, the likes are delayed. Dave, by the way, somebody said that telling a joke makes you look skinny. So, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to go back to having a joke. Oh, got lots of thumbs up coming. We're glad you guys are watching. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Colossians chapter 2. Now, this is interesting. Rodney and I had talked months ago. We planned out the year, and we had talked and sent messages, and I kind of told him where we were planning on going. And months ago, we talked about going through Colossians. Now, let me tell you something about Colossians if you don't know. Today, we're going to be in Colossians 2. So if you don't have the notes, they are on the Bible app, which we tried to post on our Facebook site. But you can turn to Colossians 2 and probably take a couple of notes and figure it out. So in Colossians chapter 2, Paul was actually um, sitting. He, you ready for this? He was on house arrest. Did you know that? Paul was on house arrest in Rome. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, uh, those of us who are Floridians who are on house arrest right now uh, or, or being uh, uh, confined to our houses for the most part, uh, uh, we are so glad we have electricity and water. We're like, wow, this is great. We have air conditioning, you know, but, um, but Paul was on house arrest. And so we understand this week. Paul wanted to be with these believers. He wanted to go visit them. He had heard about what was going on. He got a report about how great they were doing, but he also heard there were some folks that had snuck in and were trying to deceive people. And, um, and so, by the way, have you ever heard, and maybe this week you heard somebody say, I'm with you in spirit. Uh, I'm with you in spirit. You ever, and you think that's kind of a weird thing to say. It sounds like. Colossians chapter 2 is where that comes from. Paul tells the early church, you know, I can't be there with you, but I'm with you in spirit. And so this week, Colossians chapter 2 is very practical uh, for many of us. And it's funny to me because people all the time say, you know, Bible, thousands of years old. It doesn't apply to my life. Listen, same humans and the same God. And he's so good to us in the middle of all these things. So today we're going to talk about how can I or how I can disarm deception. Now, this week, many people, their biggest worry was about toilet paper. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. This right here, by the way, if you need this, if you'll just send me a note, we'll make sure we leave it out for you. Uh, but people were more worried about this than anything. Now, here's what was weird in Florida, and I don't know if this happened everywhere, but because people are so used to preparing for hurricanes, people went out and bought bottled water. Because, and, and most of them can turn their tap on, but, but because they didn't know what to expect, they didn't know what to look for, they became fearful, and, and when we get afraid, and when we get nervous, oftentimes what happens to us, by the way, just so you know, it's just like church on Sunday, people are eating, they're opening wrappers while I'm talking, so it doesn't, it only, it only takes one person in this room in order to distract me, it takes no time at all, enjoy that, I, I'm jealous now. Now, I don't know if you know this, so they talk about, this is a real $20 bill. And I don't, yeah, <laughs> they're holding out their hands. I'm sure you are at home too, but, um, but, but this is a $20 bill. Now, let me tell you something about this. If you want to know about a $20 bill, yes, you can glance at the fakes. Yes, you can know about the fakes. But if somebody wants to know what an authentic $20 bill looks like, they have to study the real thing. They learn about watermarks. They learn about being able to look through the dollar. They be able to, the little ribbon that runs around separate on money. And there's certain things that are imprinted and they know where things is. And experts can take even a magnifying glass and look at documents and money and figure out what's fake. Why? Because they know what a real $20 bill looks like. Now, here's the deal. If you're going to fight deception in life... If you're going to fight the need to think that toilet paper is your most essential thing in the world, then too often we realize we've been deceived. We've pursued the wrong thing. So how do I do that when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to my faith? How do I know what to believe? Here's the deal. Let me let you know this. And here's the big part of, of all of Colossians, but chapter 2 especially. Jesus is enough. 
Jesus is who he is and is enough. And today we're going to talk about how, you know, even though we tend to focus on other things, sometimes we focus on our works, thinking we're going to try to please God. Even if we became Christians and we became Christians knowing we had to follow on his grace, then we go back to works. Or we get self-centered and we focus on pleasing ourselves. And so, and so how do we get past that and anxiety and trying to do more and being worried when we get to know him instead? When we really understand who he is and spend time with him and really spend time with God in his word, then we'll begin to be those bionic Christians, those that walk in power. So number one point today, first of all, if we're going to disarm deception, number one, we have to grow in knowing Christ. Do you need wisdom? Do, do you, have you prayed lately for wisdom? Here's what it says in chapter 2 of Colossians. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. By the way, this word contending means I'm concerned for you. Paul, remember, is on house arrest in Rome. He wants to go see this early church. He wants to help them. He's concerned for them. Anybody relate to that this week? And then he says, for you and those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. So what's he doing? He's sending out a Facebook note, a letter. He had a friend carry it on those Roman roads. And he says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in Heart. By the way, this word for encourage here is the word for comfort. It's where we get the word for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the word paraclete. It, it literally means to comfort. And by the way, one of the things you can pray for people, the Bible says that he's the great comforter. And so you pray, God, would you comfort my friend? Most of us have a friend right now who's struggling with that idea of needing comfort, feeling security, and you can't give it to them. But God can and when we pray for people, he does that. And then it continues. And united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that one, no one may deceive you by find Sounding arguments. There are people who are really good speakers, but what they're saying just isn't true. And so how do you know what's truth and what's not? You look at God's word. And then it continues. And, it, and if I could not lose my place, it'd be even better. So then just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. And then it says, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. And then I love this. Overflowing. I got ahead of you. you. You just go forward a couple more. Overflowing with thankfulness. Are you overflowing with thankfulness? By the way, one of the things, if you're struggling with worry, that's good to do is take some time to be thankful. Look outside. Thank God for what you have. Take time to, to go through a list of people and be thankful for them. Listen, I sometimes, what I do, is, as, as years ago, I heard Peter Lord say, use the alphabet to be thankful. I do that with things. And I usually start with apples. I really need to be more creative. But I also do it with people. I also do it with people. Not all of us, not all of us have friends that have an X in their name. But if you grew up in Miami, you know at least one Xavier. Right? And so we're thankful for all those people. So take some time to... Some time? Take some time. Or some time to be thankful. And then it says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. And there was this group called the Gnostics. And Paul uses a word here to kind of make fun of them. He calls them pseudo-Gnostics. That's what this word means here. It's this idea of a deceptive philosophy. They were trying to say it doesn't matter what you do in the body. And they were trying to say that Jesus was less than he is. And Paul says, watch out for fake knowledge people, people who pretend they know everything. Do you know a know-it-all? Are you sitting right now at home with a know-it-all? Are you the know-it-all? I don't know. But, but, you know, right, by the way, don't bump them if they're the ones that's a know-it-all, okay? But here's the thing, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Many years ago, there was a missionary to the Himalayas who could not get to the village, and he, the village that was in the mountain. So he stayed outside, and he ministered to the people in the city down the mountain but he couldn't get to the mountain, but he began praying for the different people and that in the mountain. 
And it says in that story that eventually when he got to go up to the mountain, he realized those people had grown. And in many cases, he felt like they had grown more than the people he ministered to every week because he prayed for them. We need to realize sometimes that all of our effort, all of the things we're trying to do, we're trying to fix something, we're trying to make it better, we're trying to deal with a situation, we're going to talk the person into something, or we're going to try to figure Sometimes it's better if we stop and pray. By the way, always it's better <laughs> if we stop and we pray. Too often we're trying to force something. And too often we allow our lives to get beyond us. Listen, if you find that you're anxious, if you find that you're frustrated, take some time to read scripture. One of the things I've told people over the years, if you're really emotional, it's sometimes hard to read a whole passage. Sometimes it's it's hard to read an entire passage. So I encourage people, read one verse. Get a hold of one verse that you can hang on to and ask God to pour it in your heart. The other thing I tell people to do is read a psalm. Now realize that even a psalm can be twisted. Remember, Psalms 91, which is a great psalm, a lot of people are quoting that now, is the same psalm that Satan used to tell Jesus to jump off the mountain. And so just because it's scripture, make sure that it's not taken out of context. Why? We need to ask God. And here's a prayer for you. Father, teach me to pray and teach me to read your word. Because just as in the time that Paul was talking about, there were people who were trying to lead the people in the church astray. Some by saying, you've got to do more religious deeds. And others by saying, just do whatever you want. As long as you're content, God just wants you to be happy. And Paul was saying, neither of those is true. Be careful. Look at God's word. Spend time knowing Christ. Number two. Not only do we grow in knowing Christ, we ground our faith in forgiveness. Ground our faith in forgiveness. Now, a lot of you know this story. Maybe you don't. My mom hates it when I tell these stories because she thought I was such a good kid. So, mom, if you're watching, if you just want to hold your ears for just a minute at the house, and I'll do like this when I'm done. So go ahead, do that. All right. When I was a senior in high school... I was in a class, and we were allowed to have out-to-eat lunch. Well, I came back from lunch, and I was a minute late, and the teacher locked the door, and there were about 10 of us sitting outside. So I thought, I'm going to run to my locker real quick and get my books. My locker was literally right there. So I went to my locker, got my books. In the meantime, the teacher let everyone in except me and locked me out. Oh, I was mad. So finally, he let me into class. I went into class. I sat down, and I did what you do when you're ADD. You say things that you wish you hadn't said. And so as I sat down, he said something, and I did one of these <laughs> under my breath. And he, I'll say this is his mistake, but it really is my mistake. He said, what did you say? And I said, you're living up to your name. By the way... That wouldn't have been so bad, but he was the dean of the school. And little did I know that I had been in trouble and didn't know about it, that, that I actually, there was a possibility I wouldn't graduate. I didn't find this out until just a few years ago when one of my teachers back then said there were actually board meetings about me and a few other students not graduating. So this guy had already stood up for me. I had no idea. And so he said, go outside and come to my office. So I went to his office and I thought, for sure, I'm going to die. This is going to be the end of my life because if he doesn't kill me, my father will kill me. One way or the other, I'm going down. This is going to be my death day. By the way, I don't know if you've ever had to walk to the principal's office. It literally becomes 17 miles longer when you have to walk there quietly with people looking at you, seeing you follow the dean to the principal's office. So we get to the principal's, the principal's office, go into the dean's office. We sit down. He looks at me. He says, Eric, you're a pretty good kid. I thought, you don't know me real well. But anyway, okay. And he said, uh, and I said, I'm really sorry. I was just upset. You know, you let everybody else in and didn't let me in. I'm very sorry. Whatever, you know, whatever you need to do. He looked at me and said, you know what? I'll tell you what. Let's forget today ever happened. I said, what? He said, I'll tell you what, Eric. Let's forget today ever happened. I said, you, you mean like what just happened? He said, what happened? I said, okay, thank you so much. He said, go to class. I went back to class. 
as I walked back to class, my friend said, what happened? What happened? What happened? I said, nothing. They're like, what? I'm like, he said to forget it. And they were like, what? I'm like, I know. It was unbelievable. He totally just said, forget it. Now listen, here's what's awesome about that. Even more so, that's what God does for you and for me. We come to him, we say, God, I'm sorry I did this. And he goes, you know what? Because I love you so much, because you surrendered your life to me. And as Christians, we believe that what happens is as people surrender their lives to Christ, as they say, Jesus, I want you to take my sins. I know you died on a cross to forgive me and rose from the dead. I believe you're God. Please, I surrender my life to you. And the Bible says, he says, okay, let's forget about everything you've ever done. It's wiped clean. Listen to what Paul says in verse, uh, uh, the next one, nine, as we pick it up. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And he's referring to the idea that was happening in John 1.1. 1, 1. And if you look in Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice it says, let us make man in our image. Why does it say us? Because the Trinity and Jesus was already there. When we were created, he is God. He was there. He was there with God, the Bible says. And then it says, in Christ, you, talking about us, have been brought to fullness. He is the head of every power and authority. Do you hear that? If you are a follower of Christ, the Bible says that he's over any other power or authority. What are you afraid of today? He's over it. What are you worried about today? He is over every power, every authority. He has authority over them. And then it says, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. What's he saying here? He's saying, it's not your works. It's not the things you do. He's the one that's doing it for you. It says, your whole self was ruled by the flesh. Oh, yes. Ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, which, by the way, if you've ever seen a baptism by immersion, almost every pastor says almost the same thing. Why? Because it comes from the Bible. Buried with him in baptism. That baptism, that's where we get this idea. Buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And then it says, when you were dead in your sin and the uncircumcised of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. And then it says this, he forgave us some of our sins. The ones that aren't really bad. The ones that weren't, no, no, all of our sins. When you came to the principal's office and said, Jesus, I'm sorry. He said, let's just forget about yesterday. Let, let's forget about all those things you've done. Let's forgive all of those things you have done in your past. And then he says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. I know exactly what that feels like. I knew I wasn't going to graduate. I knew that I was going to have detention. I knew that he was going to call my dad. None of it. All written off. All that debt was forgiveness. And then it said, stood against us. Condemning us. And that was the thing. Can you imagine that walk down to the principal's office? Eric, why did you say that? Eric, why did you do that? Eric, you should have been smarter. You should know better. You ever condemn yourself? You ever feel like you're worthless? You ever feel like, oh, I wish I could do better. I can't believe I blew it. When that happens and you go to God and you say, God, forgive me. He goes, let's forget about what happened. I forgive you. And then it continues which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So not only did Jesus do that, he defeated all of it. He says, yesterday no longer happened. You are forgiven. He took all of your punishment on him. That's what we mean by nailed it to the cross. And here's the truth for you and for me. We all need forgiveness. None of us deserve forgiveness. And when you go through life sometimes and you're like me and you do something dumb and you suddenly feel that overwhelming sense of shame and guilt, the enemy wants you to stay right there. Stay in that shame. Stay in that guilt. You know what God wants you to do? If you've offended somebody else or hurt somebody else, you know what God wants you to do? Ask their forgiveness first. Ask his forgiveness. 
Ask his forgiveness, ask their forgiveness. Ask their forgiveness, ask his forgiveness. Say, God, would you forgive me for that thing? And obviously, if it's somebody we've hurt, we do our best to make that right when it doesn't hurt them. But when we go to God and he forgives us, the Bible says it's like as if it never happened. And so you don't have to walk in guilt. You don't have to walk in shame. Those things that you've done in the past, you surrender them to him. Because here's what happens. If you don't do that, If you beat yourself up all the time, it's like a toothpaste tube. You might be able to hold it in for a little while and be the church lady. Oh, I'm so special. And if you've ever been to Disney World and it's a small world, there are Christians that look like it's a small world. As you go by them, they're like, how are you doing? You're like, I'm so blessed. I'm doing great. And you're thinking, you've either had Botox or you've got medicine, or something's wrong with you. Well, sometimes what happens is, because we don't realize we've been forgiven, we have to pretend that we're better than we are. We have to pretend that somehow, by doing deeds, or doing a bunch of activities, that we're more spiritual. So we do that, or, and that's one group that Paul was dealing with, or we do the other side, and we just say, I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm happy. And the truth is, when we receive God's forgiveness, then we're able to live in right relationships with others. And we don't, when that toothpaste tube is squeezed, instead of all the anger and frustration and guilt and shame coming out, what comes out? God's love. Thankfulness. And when we're under stress, by the way, we find out who we really are. When we're under stress, we find out what really was rolling around in our heads. That's why we th- sing this, say this second prayer. Father, thank you for forgiving me. By the way, sometimes when you ask other people for forgiveness, they can say no. Did you know that? You, you can ask somebody to forgive you for something you've done, and they may look at you and go, no, they don't have to forgive you. But God has chosen to forgive you and to forgive me, even though he didn't have to. So we grow in knowing Christ, grounded faith and forgiveness. And finally, number three, guard my faith in Christ and not in me. This means it's not about your works. But one of the things that can happen, no no matter how long you've been a Christian, you will think God loves you more when you behave and he loves you less when you don't. And whatever your definition of behave is, by the way, So maybe behave for you is I had a quiet time every day. God loves me more. Or I forgot my quiet time this morning. God doesn't love me as much. Or I spent time in prayer. So boy, I'm just really, God loves me more today. Or I didn't spend time in prayer. God doesn't love me as much today. I was terrible in traffic. So God doesn't love, listen, God loves you on your worst day just as much. Now that doesn't mean that you don't need to confess. It doesn't mean you don't need to make things right with him. But the truth is, That he absolutely loves you. It's not works-based. It's not you trying to earn it. Listen to what it says here in verse 16. Therefore, don't let anybody judge you by what you eat or drink with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. And basically what was happening is they were arguing about things that didn't matter. And Paul said, don't let people judge you about those things. And then he said, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. And this was people who pretended to be humble but really weren't. Have you met those people? Do you know those people? Are you thinking of somebody right now? Somebody who, hey, how you doing? They're really nice to your face, but you found out they're saying stuff behind your back. They pretend that they're humble and really what they're trying to do is sucker you. They they, they pretend they're somebody that they're not. And Paul says, hey, watch out for those people who are pretend. Why? Because such a person goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're trying to show you how spiritual they are, how much they know everything about them. And then they continue. They're puffed up with idle notions in their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head. He's talking about Jesus from the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to elemental spiritual forces of this world, why? As though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. These rules which have to do with all the things that are destined to perish with youth are based on human commands and teaching. Such regulations indeed have an appearance. They seem really wise. 
with self-imposed worship, not God worship, not things Scripture talks about, self-imposed. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to whip myself on the back when I don't behave. Martin Luther used to, when he'd sin, would climb upstairs on his knees as a monk and whip himself thinking, I've got to show God I'm repentant. And then one day he came across Romans 5.1, which said the just shall live by faith. He was teaching the book of Romans, and he realized it's not about me self-mutilating myself in order to earn God's love. I receive his love because of what he's done. And then he says, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. When life for us is about, I've got to control this, I've got to do this, I've got to make this happen for God to love me, then immediately when the pressure is on, what do we do? We get on the internet. We look at things we shouldn't look at. This week, pornography on the internet has surged dramatically during this time. Why? Because people are stressed out. They're trying to do all kinds of things. And when they still feel frustrated, they're looking for a worldly way to get out of where they are instead of running to God. Saying, Jesus, I need you. I need your presence. Instead of going for a walk and saying, God, I want to walk in gratitude and thanksgiving. God, I want to pray for these people. Listen, the enemy wants you to be distracted, to hurt people, to push people down, to devalue people. So what happens? When we get angry, what do we do? We devalue people. When we get frustrated, what do we do? We devalue people. But when we recognize that I'm not saved because of my works... Then when somebody blows it and they mess up, we're like, yeah, I struggle with that too. And we pray for them. And when we mess up and we blow it, instead of putting more and more pressure on ourselves, we go to the principal's office and we say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry for what I've done. And Jesus looks at us and says, let's go on with today. Let's, let's go on like yesterday never happened and move forward. Your final prayer today is this, Father, thank you that I'm saved by faith. I want to ask you again the question I started with as we get ready to close. Dave, are you doing a closing song today? So Dave's going to come up here. Is Jesus enough? Is it, is it toilet paper that you need? What other thing are you seeking to make you happy or to make you content or to make you feel safe? I want to encourage you. Spend time in God's word. Spend time in prayer. Seek his forgiveness. Find out more of who Jesus is because as you do that, you'll find the joy and comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit that you can't produce by any action, by no matter how many rolls of toilet paper or water you have at your house. God wants you to know him more. I'm going to pray this prayer that we have on the screen here, and then I'm going to pray for you, and then our praise team is going to come sing. Father, I want to know you more. Help me to grow in my ability to hear your still small voice. Thank you for forgiving me through faith in you. Help me to walk in faith each day, knowing that you love me. Thank you for dying for me so I can live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray anyone who's watching online now or watching later in this week, Father, that right now, First of all, if they're a believer, that they would know your forgiveness and your comfort. Father, that if they have, have blown it with somebody else and they need to ask forgiveness, that they would ask forgiveness. Father, if they've pursued wrong thinking and, and anxiousness or, or pornography or other things, that Father, they would ask your forgiveness and ask you to give them your strength and comfort. So they would no longer try to comfort themselves. Instead, they would just receive your comfort and walk in thanksgiving. Lord, I pray also for that one who may be watching today who doesn't know you. That today, Father, they would recognize that you, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And you came because we can't meet God, but you came to us. And so, Father, you came, and I pray today they would accept your salvation. You said in John 3, 16, that you loved us so much that you gave Jesus for us. So I pray, Father, for that one that's watching today that needs you, that they would surrender their heart and life to you. And Father, they would receive your free gift of salvation, knowing that you died on a cross and rose again for them. 
Father, I also pray for that one today who maybe as a Christian has forgotten how much you've forgiven them, that today they would receive that forgiveness right where they are. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if